kind of uh, culminate the messages that I've uh, been preaching and, and uh, giving for our church to be able to help us prepare uh, for Easter. And uh, I, I want to kind of speak directly to our heart tonight and really find out where we are. And uh, what I'd like for you to do is turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, the Gospel of Mark. And uh, turn there to Mark chapter 1. And I want to show a very important statement to you and read a few verses to you tonight uh, that come right from God's Word here in uh, Mark chapter 1. And it's the story of the leper. And so tonight, really the title of the message is Loving the Outcast. Loving the Outcast. And let me say this, let me, while you're turning to Mark chapter 1, um, yesterday we had a, a, just, a, a, just an awesome day. Um, Donnie got up this morning, he's told me, and he, he said he got up and was walking around his house to do some things, fixing his coffee and getting ready this morning, and he said, man, why are my calves just feel like they're on fire? Why are they sore? And he says, man, he says, I'm a little tired today. He goes, man, what in the world? And then he goes, that preacher. <laughs> now, he didn't say that preacher, but I think he was probably thinking. He says, I forgot all those hills we did yesterday, right? And I'm going to tell you, if there's a reason to get worn out, if there's a reason to get tired, if there's a reason to be sore, it ought to be to go out and knock on some doors. Amen? I want you to know that uh, I estimate, and uh, I may be doing a little bit of a low estimate, uh, we probably did four to 500 doors yesterday. We had so many groups go out that uh, we couldn't have fit everybody on a bus. Amen? Isn't that exciting? And uh, <laughs> amen, get happy for Jesus. Yeah, that's okay. Listen, it's okay to clap in church, all right? You clap at that TV and them ball games, might as well clap in church. You know, it's a whole lot better anyway. But, you know, it's amazing to me. I want you to know that yesterday made an impact. It made a difference. How do you know that? There were people in this service this morning that were from the doors that we knocked on yesterday. So you know what that tells me? Next week ought to be in a bigger. Why? Because you're going to show up at 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock on Saturday this week, right? Amen. I want to see you here. Bring your shoes, bring your bandages, bring all kinds of stuff. Whatever you got to do, just come and uh, bring your suntan lotion in case it's sunny and hot. But uh, the Lord gave us a window. It was pouring down rain uh, during the time that we were in here in class going over some things and just getting equipped to evangelize. And, um, but uh, at 10 o'clock, the Lord just stopped the rain. I believe he wanted us to go. And I believe that there were people who needed to have their doors knocked on. And I believe that people needed to be reminded, needed to know that we care, needed to know that Jesus loves them. And all they were waiting on was an invitation. You know what we do? We go and give an invitation. We go invite people. And you know what we did yesterday? We just went out and loved the outcast. Say, who's the outcast? Anybody other than you. Any, loving the others, being a church for others, just loving anybody outside yourself. And so it's important for us to be mindful that it takes that kind of commitment. This week we're going to go do the same thing. Why? Because it's important. Say, will it be a long day? Yeah, this will probably be one of the longest weeks I've had since I've been here. And, but why? Because we're building up for the resurrection. We're building up to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's fine. I'll take time off next week. I'm not worried about it. Why? It's important. And there are sacrifices that have to be made. Because others are important. And, and so when we talk about loving the outcast and being a church for others, um, imagine with me a moment. As we go into the story here, imagine a dirty child coming up and hugging their mother. Imagine with me a, a child that goes out and they're in the, in, in outside and they're all dirty and they come up and go, Hey mom, give me a hug. And what does the mom typically do? Don't you hug me, go get in the bath. You're like your father. No. And, um, but you know what? That's how the church treats the lost a lot of times. You're dirty. Go get cleaned up before you come here. You're dirty. Go get cleaned up before you come in here and mess up what we're doing. That's not Jesus' approach. And today we want to see how Jesus responded exactly the same way towards the leper here. 
Look at Mark chapter 1. Look at this one verse with me. Look at verse 40. The Bible says, verse 40, And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou can make me clean. This is amazing to me in itself here, because lepers, now listen to me, were the outcast in society of this day. It was the ultimate uncleanness for a Jew. If you had leprosy, it meant a lot of isolation and loneliness. You know, a good question to think about, are there outcasts in our society today? How about those who are physically handicapped? Are they considered outcasts? How about those stuck in a nursing home and all are alone, and nobody goes to visit them. One of the saddest things to me is in the nursing homes, uh, when I go in there, and I usually go because I'm going to go visit someone, and all the doors that I walk by, and you look in there, and there's nobody in there except that one person. And all the doors that you go by, and people in their wheelchairs, people at the table, nobody around. A lot of times they're strapped in, and there's nobody to just say hi and give them a smile. I usually take my kids with me. Why? Because they love kids and kids warm up the environment and they'll speak to kids long before they'll speak to an adult. And it's just environment. And that's why you see dogs and cats in nursing home. Why? Because they're more friendly than people. It's a shame. But they're outcasts of society. Well, you're too old and outdone. Let me just throw you in your home and be done with you. Now I'm saying there's a time and place for that if that happens. But I'm going to tell you something. It's a shame, and it ought to be a shame of you if that's part of your family and you never go and visit them. Hello? I told my wife, I said, I will haunt you if I die if you ever leave me and never come visit me. Why? Because I don't want to be alone. Even when I'm out of my mind, I don't want to be alone. I may not know how to put my socks on, but don't leave me alone. Please. I don't want to be alone. Imagine all the people that are alone tonight. Sitting by their TV or maybe even sitting by the phone or maybe sitting in total darkness tonight just wondering if anybody really cares. Where's the church at? Wish some church would knock on my door. How about those with addictions? Those with addictions to pornography, those with addictions to drugs, those with addictions to, to uh, 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 all types of, uh, uh, of uh, addictions. It could be shopping, it could be pill popping, it could be addictions to just hoarding, not wanting to get rid of anything. I mean, they make TV shows out of it now, hoarding, buried alive. People make profit on it. When people cover themselves and cover up all their hurts and their heartaches and what they're crying out for saying is, would somebody pay attention to me? It's a cry for help, folks. I mean, we live in America. We live in a, a place where everybody's got enough stuff. We got more stuff when we know what to do with. People hoard and bury them stuff, themselves in all this stuff, and we wonder why they do it. I'll tell you why. Because somewhere along the line, you'll see that maybe they thought, even from themselves, and it could be misaligned, that they stopped realizing and probably wondered if anybody ever cared about them. So you know what they did? They start caring about stuff because it made them feel better. They're outcasts in our society. How about those who are homeless? We typically walk by the homeless and go, oh, they're asking for money again. We'll work for food. You ever see that? And them hold up them signs? And I know what we think. Why don't you go out and get a job? Well, let me ask you this. How hard is it for some of you to go get a job? Hello? Don't preach it if you can't live it. And we throw that stuff out, and I know what we meant, and some people make a living by being homeless. Let me tell you something. I worked in a homeless shelter uh, uh, for, in college. That's how I got through college. I ran a homeless shelter and ran the volunteer base, uh, 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 volunteer uh, section of that, also coordinate all that, and the preaching services and all that for a rescue mission while I was in college. Listen, I know that some of them can make a real good living at it. 
But I tell you what, I can't make and put everybody in the same uh, bracket or in the same uh, bucket or, 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 or make everybody in the same, uh, uh, just look like the same because there's a few who mess it up for everybody else. And I know that some take advantage of the government and there are some people ride the system and I, all know, I know that. But I tell you what, some people right now living, coming to this church tonight, may even come this morning, are one check from being living under a bridge. It could happen to you. It could happen to me. It's not always someone's fault. Well, what did you do? Well, they could have been outsized. They could have been undercut. Their, their company could have cut them and, and their wife could have lost their job or their family could have been split before this. And it just one decision after another of someone else. And all of a sudden they found out their home is gone. It's foreclosed. And now there's, there's no money. And now the, they foreclosed on their home and da, 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 da. And all of a sudden they are now living at Salvation Army and figuring out, well, I've got five days here. Will I go after that and get meals? They're outcasts in our society. How about those with AIDS and HIV? And how about those in our society that uh, have syphilis and, and gonorrhea and all those things that we kind of look at and we kind of shun? Let me tell you something. It's the leprosy of the day, but the church shouldn't shun them. Why? Because they're the outcast. And the leper came to Jesus and bowed at his knees, but he came to Jesus. How about those children who are overweight and may be, can't seem to fit in with all the other kids? You know, kids can be mean and cruel. And you better watch what your kids say. And you ought to be careful and you ought to correct them on the spot when they don't use their mouth appropriately. You know, you've heard the saying, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything all, at all. Hey, may be a real quiet home for some of you, but that's okay. You know, I think about those who are mentally challenged. I love kids who are developmentally ill. Love those children that have Down syndrome. They seem just to have a little bit something special about them that's real loving. I kind of almost think that sometimes we're the weird ones or something's wrong with us, not them. When we get to heaven, we'll know, won't we? I just don't believe that God makes any mistakes, folks. I don't. But society would like to rid them of them. After all, planned, parent, planned Parenthood would like to rid every mother that has a child that may be born that way. Let me test your baby. Let me test your, your, your womb. Let me test the, the, the embryo. Let me test, let me test the fluid in you. Let me test the blood. Let me test all that so we can find out. We wouldn't let them do it with us, with Abigail. Want to know why? Because it didn't matter to us. God has given us a child. We're going to have that child. We're going to carry that child to full term if God will allow. And we're going to give birth to that baby. Why? Because every good and perfect gift comes from God. But some see those children as outcasts. How about teens who are in juvenile delinquency? How about those teens that are in the juvenile delinquency centers and no one comes to see them? Mom and dad or whoever, grandma, whoever is the guardian, just kind of shucked them out the door and says, well, I can't handle you, go ahead. Maybe they can handle you, and that may be true sometimes. And I understand you have to do what you have to do. But I tell you what, even those teens need someone to love them. Even those teens need someone just to say, hey, I care. You don't have to know their name. You don't have to know their background. You don't even have to know their, their history, any of that. You, but you can love them. It's almost like that if we get close enough to these people, we'll get the cooties. You know, lepers used to have to shout, unclean, unclean, in public assembly. Can you imagine if we have to walk into church and say, I'm a sinner! I'm a pornographer. I'm an addict. I'm a child abuser. I'm a wife beater. I've done drugs. I've stolen. I've cheated. I've lied. Okay, well, come on in. Since you told us, it's fine. Come on in. And we may not do that in the church, but I tell you by our actions, sometimes that's how we treat people. And we say all are welcome. 
Come on in. Jesus accepts you just as you are, but I got a few stipulations. The church ought to be in a repentive mindset. The church ought to be broken about our actions. And when I say church, I mean I'm speaking broad. I believe our church is doing a great job, but I also believe we can do better. And I believe that in order for us to become a church for others, we're going to have to love the dirty. We're going to have to love the sinner. We're going to have to love the single mom. We're going to need to love the single dad. We're going to need to love the family that just went through a hard divorce. We're going to need to love the drug addict. We're going to need to love the person who may just have pounded their wife. And it may be despicable and we hate it and we won't stand for that stuff. But I tell you what, someone needs to love them. If the church doesn't do it, who will? If the church doesn't reach out to them, who will? If the church doesn't care, who will? You think Satan cares? I don't think so. If he did, none of this stuff would be happening. There are many in our society who feel like outcasts because of divorce. There are many in our society who are outcasts because of physical abuse. There are some who are outcasts because of sexual abuse, because of mental abuse, because of emotional abuse. And all of it's abuse. There are many in our society who feel just like this leper. I believe there are many who even attend our church. I believe there are many who come on Sunday and Wednesdays and Sunday night. I believe that there may even be some of you here in this church tonight who may feel just like this guy. Oh, you may not have an outward blemish where your skin is about to fall off and your fingers and your nose just all of a sudden go boop. Can you imagine that sitting at someone's table and all of a sudden your ear fall off in the chili? Now you can understand the kind of why people didn't want them around because it was ooky, it was ooh. I mean, their skin would ooze off. It would just fall off the bone, and then eventually it would lead to where the bones would fall off, fingers, toes, noses, ears. I believe there are many people in our church that may feel just like this, and it may not be a physical outward uh, demonstration, but in their heart, and maybe in their, from their past, or from their guilt and the shame that they have on them, from family or friends or neighbors or co-workers, or whatever their past may bring, whatever Satan brings up in their life, they feel just like this leper. Unclean, unclean. You know... They feel very alone. They feel cut off from society. They feel isolated by the church. They feel like nobody wants to be around them. I had a gentleman tell me this morning, he says, he just had a church recently tell him that he was not welcome. I don't know the whole story, and that's not important for me to know. But for someone just to be able to phrase that on their list, lips that the church said, I'm not welcome. How would you feel? Tom, you're not welcome here any longer. How would that make you feel? It's not right, folks. Can I be honest with you tonight? I'll be a little transparent with you. All of us have baggage. If you're perfect and you got it all together and, and you, everything's well, well in your life and, and uh, I mean, you perfectly understand God's Word and you live holy and righteous, go ahead and exit now. You're free to go. No, I can't cast a stone at anybody. There's no stones in my pocket. Only lint. I got lint in my pocket. Want to know why? Because at times I feel just like this guy. Say, but you're the preacher. Yeah, but I can still feel like this. Why? Because sometimes I'm wondering if, I, if I'll just be accepted or if people will like the messages or if, or if people will like me when I come to their home. Everybody wants to be accepted. Everybody. Everybody wants to be well liked. I do. 
And we're all that way. We're all human. I want to make people happy. I want everybody to be pleased with what I'm doing. I know it's not a real world for that to happen, but I'd like for it to happen. And if it's only in my mind, that's okay. But in my heart, I just like for people to be appreciative and like what I'm doing. And I just want people to get along. And, and I just want to think that everything's okay. But guess what? It's not. And sometimes in the deepest secrets of your heart or when you lay your head on the pillow at night, sometimes that thought goes in your head and you wonder, does anybody really care about me? Even in the church, they say they care and they hoop and holler and they pat you on the back and they scratch your head and they scratch you where you hit sometime and they tell you, oh, that's real good and oh, that's nice and lovely. Oh, the choir did good and all these things. But listen, at the end of the day, does the church really care? In no way or shape or form can we say that we care and not do anything about it. Don't you tell that lost person that you care and then don't go reach them. Don't tell that neighbor that you care and then not walk across the street and invite them to church. Don't tell that divorced person that you love them and care for them. And don't try to get them counseling and help to put their marriage back together. Don't you dare say that you care and do nothing about it. You'll be nothing more than a hypocrite if you do that. This is where the church and the body of Christ come in. This is where we come in here. And on the screen, there are many in society who feel like outcasts. But I'm going to tell you, at a church for others, which is our church, I believe, not only outcasts are, are loved, but they're welcomed here. They are welcomed at our church. And you say, preacher, ah, da, da, and ah, da, da. Listen, I don't want to hear that stuff. Listen, as the pastor of this church, they can walk in that door, and I'll be the first to greet them and shake their hand. Why? Because if this isn't a place they can change, who can change them? I believe that they ought to be welcomed here, and I think they ought to be loved here. And that's why it's so important for our church to be loving the outcast. And you say, why? Why? Well, it's very simple. And on the screen, first thing is just this. Because Jesus loves outcasts. That's why. Will you love the outcast? Jesus loves them. See, in verse 40, this leper came and approached Jesus. He was taking a chance. No leper was to go around any person other than his own colony, and especially no Jew. Why? Because Jews were very peculiar who they hung around. Why do you think the Jews even crucified Christ? Why do you think that they looked at Jesus on the cross and said, He's not our king? No Jew would be found on a cross that's made for thieves and murderers and blasphemers. That ain't our God. Jews would snub their nose at certain uh, people in society. And let me tell you something. Sometimes the church is no different. We snub our nose at people that are different than us. They dress different. They smell different. They look different. Got long hair. Got ears pierced. Got tattoos. Wear jeans. Wear shorts. Wear flip flops. Oh my! The church is sold out. We better be careful. Jesus loved outcasts. And here this leper came to Jesus taking a chance. But Jesus could have walked away as the scribes and Pharisees did. Or that Jesus might cast stones and, and taunt him as the others did. But he felt that Jesus was different. He felt that this man might be just the one who could change him and make his life whole again. And boy was he ever right. Look at verse 41. And Jesus moved with compassion. He put forth his hand and he touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. Whoa, a glorious miracle had happened. But it wasn't in his healing. It wasn't in him having healing. I think the miracle happened when he was moved with compassion and he touched him. 
Do you see that in your, your Bible? Look at verse 41. It, it says, and he was moved with compassion. It says he touched him. Who are you to touch a leper? Don't you know that stuff's contagious? Don't you know you can get the cooties? I'm sure Jesus didn't have this in his day. Circle, circle, dot, dot, dot. Now you got the cootie shot? You know, our kids know that. I'm sure Jesus didn't have that lingo down in his day. And he didn't care. You never heard that one. Well, you got it here. I'm sure Jesus didn't care. Why? Because he was moved with compassion. His heart said something different. He didn't care what society may have said. He didn't care what the statistician said. He didn't care what the numbers said. He didn't care what the counselor said. He didn't care what the philosopher says. He just touched him. He touched him. He touched the leper. Woo, he touched the leper. Why? Because Jesus loves the outcast. He loves the outcast. Jesus loved this leper. And he took action when no one else did. That's the church. Let's take action when no one else will. Let's beat them to the punch. Let's get there before anybody gets there. Let's beat the Jehovah's Witness. Let's beat the Mormons. Let's beat the Seventh-day Adventists. Let's beat the Latter-day Saints. Let's beat them all. Why? Because we love the outcast. Let's beat them there. It ought to move us to action. Jesus acted when the rest of society forsook this man. Hey, leper, if you could, could you go live over there? Could you go live over there? I, I know it's no one around there, but you know what? You can have all the place to yourself. You have plenty of room to build. But could you move over there? Because we really don't want you over here. He acted when this man's own religion ignored him. May the church never ignore the outcast. I wonder how many people in our community are like this leper and think, I wonder if those people at Freedom, I wonder if they're really different. I wonder if those people at Freedom will really love me this time. I wonder if they will accept me and help me. Or will they be like every other church and tell me, go away. See, as the church, we feel like we have to all have all the answer. My, fo my, my friend, I don't have to have all the answer. All the answers are right here. I don't have to know them all. I just know how to get you to the answers. I wonder if we are like that. Just as this man came to Jesus, people come to us. They come to us on Sunday morning. They come to us on Sunday night. They come to us during the midweek Bible study. They come to the teens on Sunday. They come uh, to the Iwana program. They come to our Bible studies. They come to our activities. They ride on our buses. They come to our outreach ministries. They'll come on Easter. They'll come to any event and outreach opportunity that we have. Jesus didn't turn his back on the outcast or walk away, ignore them. Nor can we. See, Jesus brings them to our front door and sometimes we ignore them. What I'm saying is, why don't we just go to their door and welcome them to our church? We must not only welcome outcasts, but love and care for them. Why? It is very simple. Jesus loves outcasts. And he lives in us and desires for us to, to do the same thing. But Jesus lives in us to live in and through us. Jesus knows what it feels like to be an outcast and be forsaken and have nobody. The Bible says he had no place to even lay his head. You think Jesus was accepted in his day? I think not. The Bible reminds us that Jesus came into his own and his own received him not. The church said, we don't want you. The Pharisees and the scribes and the synagogue said, away with him. This man speaketh blasphemy. We don't want him here. This man working on the Sabbath. He's healing people. He's eating without washing his hands. Oh. We don't want him. 
I think it's easy to get wrapped up in our programs and get wrapped up in what we're doing around here and forget that our ministry is about people. Our ministry is about people. On the screen, but how do we love the outcast that God sends us? How do we love the outcast that God sends us our way? I'm going to give you two quick thoughts, and here they are. Number one, verse 41, we must allow compassion to move us. We must allow compassion to move us. Look at verse 41. And Jesus moved with compassion. This means Jesus had a deep feeling toward this man. Ten times we are told in the gospel that Jesus had compassion on people around him. It bothered him to see people suffering and in need. Does it bother you? Does it bother you when you see people in need? Does it bother you when you see people even broke down on the side of the highway? Oh, that's a shame. And we rationalize all kinds of things. I got somewhere to go. Does it bother you? Do we really care? Does it ever occur to us that people in our midst, at church, at work, etc., are deeply wounded and suffering? Do you know how long it'll take for someone to share with you their wounds and their suffering? Do you know how long it'll take? How long? Just ask. That's how long. Just talk to them. You ever talk to someone and you make this statement? I've said it many times, so have you. I didn't know. Want to know why you didn't know? Probably because you didn't ask. Probably because you didn't ask. Maybe we ought to start asking. I'm going to make a statement, and here it is. It's so easy not to care. Do you know how not to care? How do you not care, Brother Tim? Do you know? Huh? I'm, I've got it in my pocket. Here's how, you not, here's how you not care. Do nothing. See that? I had it in my pocket all the time. Nothing. If you do nothing, you know what it says? I don't care. When the church doesn't go in the community, when the church doesn't preach God's word, when the church doesn't exalt Christ, when the church doesn't go in the highways and the byways, you know what it says? We don't care. We see so much pain and suffering around us. It's easy if we're not careful to build shells and shield ourselves from the suffering around us and become hardened and callous to what's happening in society. Jesus didn't do this, did he? The Bible says he was moved with compassion. I love to see when new ministries are started. Some of you have some of the greatest new ministries that freedom has ever seen, and you're sitting on it, and you're not telling anybody. Want to know why? Because you have believed Satan's lies that says, I can't do it. Can I tell you that some of the best ministries that ever been started have not ever been started by a pastor and his staff? They've always been started by you. It's always been started by people who had a passion for it, maybe had a past from it, maybe had a hurt from it, maybe had a, uh, uh, maybe had a real uh, stricken grief about a loss of a loved one. And so you started Grief Share and started teaching that material and you led Grief Share. Want to know why? Because it was personal. Some of the best people that lead ministries have had experience from that. I love when new ministries start. But if someone wants to come, and I love it because it's something that helps people. That's why I love ministries. But if someone were to say, uh, uh, Pastor Larry, Pastor Larry, I, 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 got, I got a new ministry. I go, okay, what is it? Tell me. I'm really excited about it. Well, tell me what it is. I want to start a committee. I'm going to have to go, new. No. I'm going to have to go, uh-uh. I'm not for that. I wouldn't get very excited about that. Say, why? Because here's what happens. Committees discuss things. Ministries act. 
If someone was to come to me and say, Pastor Larry, I want to start new ministry. I want to help the poor. I'm going to get excited. I want to help the divorced. I'm going to get excited. I want to help the needy. I'll get excited. I want to help the drug addict. I'm going to get excited. But if you want to start a committee, just start it yourself and don't invite anybody, okay? (laughs) We don't need more committees. What we need is ministry. Committees talk about it. Ministries get it done. Hello? Committees talk about it. You re- does this church really need another committee? No, we need to get to acting and loving lost people and loving the outcast and being moved with compassion. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. He was moved with compassion. Committees discuss, ministries act. Committees are into maintaining. Ministries are into helping people. We don't need to maintain. We need to go on with Jesus, amen, and make an impact in this community. Why do people start new ministries? Because compassion moves them. Church for others is just a church of compassion. I believe what Jude 22 says. Jude 22 says, And some having compassion, making a difference. And some having compassion, making a difference. Want to make a difference in the community? Does this church want to make a difference? Then we must become compassionate. Without compassionate, we'll just maintain. Let's just have church. Let's not just have church. Let's have a ministry that loves the outcast. So let's allow compassion to move us. But how else can we love the ones that God sends our way? Number two, this is the last thing. We must allow Jesus to touch others through us. See, Jesus isn't here anymore. You are. Jesus lives inside of you. Verse 41, and Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him. You have to understand the life of the leper of Jesus' day to really appreciate what Christ did here. The leper had to cry out, unclean, unclean, to lest anyone got close to him. We've talked about this. But Jesus didn't avoid him. Jesus didn't run the other way like all the rest. He didn't avoid eye contact. Well, if I don't look, maybe they won't know I'm here. Jesus didn't even feel sorry for him. Jesus put forth his hand and touched him. He didn't have a pity party for him. He didn't go, oh, that's too bad. Oh, that's bad. You got a bad case of that stuff. He didn't do that. His heart said, oh, man. Man, do I love you. Come here. And he touched him. Jesus has ascended to heaven, but he has sent back forth his spirit to dwell on those who believe on him. See, now if Jesus is going to touch others, you know what? He needs people to do it. And he will do it through us, his body, the church, if we will allow him to. See, we are Jesus' hands of compassion. We are his hands of love in a world that is crying for someone to care. We are Jesus' hands. Jesus was not turned back by the repulsiveness of the leper. And he doesn't want to turn his backs on the outcast and the lepers of our society. Jesus wants us to reach out and touch them. Jesus wants us to minister to people regardless of who they are or what they are. Jesus' touch of compassion comes through us, through our touch, through our love, through our voice, through our caring. Each Sunday morning, when we come to church, our prayer should be, Lord Jesus, touch someone through me today. Lord Jesus, when I go to work tomorrow morning at 6, 7, 8, 9, whatever time you go in, touch someone through me today. Let me show compassion to someone through you today. Jesus, allow me to be a light to a dark world. Use me today to love the outcast. The question we should really be asking ourselves is, what ministry can I be involved in whereby I can touch and impact others through you, Jesus? 
A lot of times we want to be in ministry involved in things that kind of get the spotlight or maybe things that look fun or even entertaining. Listen, maybe you ought to start doing a ministry or sign up for a ministry that you can make the most impact in to allow God to use you. Could be the children's ministry. And by the way, I believe you do make the most impact through children. Why? Because they're so impressionable when they're this age. And they're like sponges. They soak up everything you tell them. So imagine all the children that come to our church each and every Sunday, other than the ones that are connected to families in our church. I wonder how much uh, comparison or percentage of bad to good that they're actually good, getting at this age. I wonder how they're exposed to things they shouldn't hear and things they shouldn't see and things they shouldn't be involved in at this age. But when they come to church, we only have them for two hours basically on Sunday morning. Can I tell you what you do and what you say and how you teach and how you care makes a difference to a little one. It makes a difference. After Jesus heals this leper, he tells him something that may seem a little strange to you. In verse 43, he straightly charged him and forthwith sent him away. And he saith unto him, verse 44, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. What seems a little strange isn't really strange if you understand the context. It was that the law of Moses commanded this, that he go and tell the priest of the day, but secondly, this was to be a testimony to them that Christ was the Messiah, that the priest didn't heal you, Jesus did. Jesus didn't say, never tell anybody. He said, but first go to the priest and show them. This guy goes out and starts telling everybody. Look at verse 45. When his life got changed, but he went out and began to publish it much. I mean, he ran it off in the newspaper. He put it in the penny saver. He put, it on, he put it in the yard sale ad. He put it in the church promo. He put it on the front page. He did a little movie spot. He did a little TV commercial time. He published it everywhere. And the blaze of brawl of the matter. I mean, he's lighting the streets up. Look what Jesus has done. And so much that Jesus could no more openly enter the city. Could you imagine? We can't open the doors anymore on Sunday. Turn them away. Can you imagine the day the fire marshal has to come in here and say, you can't handle one more person. If you do, I'm going to shut you down. Hey, come on, fire marshal, bring it on. I look forward to today. But it won't happen by what we do. It won't happen by the songs we sing. It won't happen by the phlegm and the flare and all that stuff that I may do on the platform. It will only happen by the sound teaching and preaching of God's Word and by us having compassion and loving the outcast like Jesus did. That's what will fill this place. This guy goes out and starts telling everybody. And people came to Jesus. He says that more openly he couldn't go anywhere in the city but was without in desert places. And they came to him from every quarter. Man, Jesus couldn't have got away from them. That's so awesome. People run from the church today. They see you coming to the door. Slam. <laughs> One lady waved me off before I even got off the bus. She's like, And I understand. Maybe that lady was a leper and someone from the church says, you're not welcome here. Maybe she has a hurt past. I don't know. See, when a church becomes a church for others, word spreads. Want to get the word out? Start loving the outcast. People will hear it. Man, that church at Freedom, I heard them do this to that family over there and help their family out. That's unbelievable. Man, that church came by my door. Can you believe it? They came by my door this weekend. I hope we are the talk of the town for Jesus' sake. Let's not be the talk of the town. Man, that church let me down. Anybody can have a poor testimony. Do nothing. <laughs> But to have a Christ-like testimony where people at the work are going, man, that church at Freedom, whew, 
I don't know what they're doing over there, but they must be doing something right. They came and talked to my brother-in-law, who's a drunkard. I couldn't get that guy in church for 40 years. I begged him to go to church, and he went to their church. Can you believe it? Uncle Harry, he is crazy. Do they know what he's, they're getting? He's a nut job. You know what we say at our church? Come on. Come on. You're welcomed here, and you're loved here. On the screen, I want to bring up a few things that a church for others is this. And this is an acronym. First thing is, a church that is for others is a place where outcasts are welcomed and loved. But I believe a church for others is also where a place where truth is changing lives. Let's be real honest with ourselves. It won't be by anything that we do. The only way that we can become a church for others if, is where truth is being preached and taught. And that's from the Word of God. I'm reminded that John, the Bible says in John 8, 32, uh, the truth shall set you free. What is the truth? Well, John 14, 6. And that is, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. Folks, let's not, let's not make ourselves any higher than we ought to be. Okay, lest we fall. Let me tell you something. This is the key. Want to be a truth, uh, church for others? Keep speaking the truth. It's the truth that changes lives. But the H stands for this. It stands for where hearts are growing in Christ's love. Let's be honest with ourselves, folks, tonight. We'll never be a church for others unless our heart changes. If this doesn't change, if I don't have a heart of compassion, if I don't have a heart of Christ's love, if I don't have a love like Christ has, do you think I'm really going to impact souls for Christ? I don't think so. People may be impressed, but they will not be impacted for Christ. No, a church for others is a place where outcasts are welcome and love and where truth is changing lives, but it's also a place where hearts are growing in Christ's love. This church ought to be a church that's abounding in this grace also. It's abounding in love for others. How about the E? Well, this is a good one. I love this one. Church for others is a place where every person is involved in ministry. Woohoo! Everybody's serving at freedom. Everybody's doing something. There are no seat sitters. There are no bench warmers. Everybody's in the ball game. We don't need any more spectators. We need participators. We need everybody to get in the game. Hey, the warm up is over. It's time to get in the race. Put on your running shoes. Put on your knee pads and run the race for Jesus. Why, everybody ought to be involved in ministry. How many preachers you got at that church? 300? Why, we're all ministers of the grace of God. You are a minister whether you like to be, whether you went to Bible college or, or any college, whether you went to college of hard knocks. My friend, you are a minister of the gospel. Every person is involved in ministry. I can't wait to the day where we, Donnie, have to go. Listen, please don't nobody ever sign up anymore. We can't find anything for you to do. Woo! It could happen when we become a church for others. It'll happen. When we love outcasts like Jesus loved them, when we have compassion like Jesus had, when we are moved with compassion... And love and allow Christ to live in and through us. You know what? You will serve. You will find a place to serve. Why? Because you just want to be a part of what God is doing. How about this? The R stands for reaching out through sacrificial giving. Sacrificial giving. Do You know what? It's a sacrifice to give. And it takes that for ministry to go forth. A church for others is a church that's meeting needs. And can I tell you something? It takes giving. It takes somebody like today who would say, I'll buy the hot dogs, Brother Jerry. It'll take someone like yesterday when all the teens came back from going out soul winning. These two whole rows of seats right here were filled with teens to go soul winning. Woohoo, glory to God. Man, that tickled me up. That tickled my spiritual funny bone. I got all worked up yesterday. I'm getting worked up just thinking about it now. Man, two whole rows right there of teens. Man, they were out there. They were exciting. They didn't complain about the rain when it started to drizzle. They didn't care. They were just glad they were a part of what God is doing. Let me tell you something. Someone bought them pizza yesterday after they got back. Them teens like to eat, man. 
They can't go 30 minutes without eating. I don't know what I'm going to do when my three, year, my three kids get teenagers. I'm going to go work for Domino's so I can get a package deal or something. Get free pizza or something so I can feed them. Somebody gave so those teens could eat. Brother Jerry, I'm going to brag on you and Kim a little bit. I want you to know most of those teens wouldn't have been here yesterday if Brother Jerry and Kim wouldn't have went and got them. Those teens weren't driving yesterday. They were riding. You know what that is? Sacrifice. Someone just say, I'll go get them. I'll burn the gas out of my car. Uh, Pastor Larry, I can't get up and climb up down that bus, but I can get out of my Honda Civic. I can get out of my SUV. I can get out. I don't care what the gas prices are. I'll burn the gas up for Jesus. Will that be you? All it takes us reaching out through sacrificial giving. And then the last part is spirit of servanthood abounds. Say, isn't that a whole like where everybody's involved in ministry? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. This idea right here is this person who just says this, whatever is needed, I'll do it. You need someone to go scrub that toilet because it's all plugged up? I'll go do it. I don't mind getting dirty for Jesus. I'll wipe the crown molding off. I'll paint some walls. I'll change the light bulbs. Hey, the, char- the grass needs cutting. Hey, the weeds need pulled. Hey, the trash needs tur- pulled out. Listen, I saw some cigarette butts laying around here. And uh, I'll go pick those up for you. I, don't, I want our place to look good. I don't want the place of God uh, to be in disrepair. I think it ought to be looking its best. And I want us to be looking our best for Easter and Resurrection Day. I want people to love our church. And I ought to believe it ought to be the best place. I believe it ought to look better than Walmart. Amen. Hey, what? can I do to help church for others are where people have a heart and a spirit of just servanthood they'll do whatever it takes don't worry about sign ups don't worry what we need listen we need women in the nursery listen some of you women give up a service to help a baby to help a mother so she can come in here undistracted so she didn't have to bring her babies in here so the babies don't distract in the service would you like a baby in the service just weeping and crying and hacking and coughing and playing and slurping and slopping and snotting and all that stuff would you like that sitting beside you Well, then guess what? Get rid of the nursery and guess where they'll be? They'll be right in here. Somebody needs to serve in the nursery. You know what it is? I'll give up a Sunday once a month to serve my Jesus, my King. I'll give up a Sunday to work in junior church. I'll give up a Sunday and ride the bus. I'll give up a Sunday or Saturday and go out and win souls. I'll go up and knock on doors this Saturday. I'll go out and go visit the bus kids. Why? Because I just have a heart to serve. I just want to serve wherever the wherever the need is just tell me what the need is i'll do it i'm not worried about where i may fit just yet i just want to serve my king i just want to serve jesus oh that's a heart for others that's a church for others that's loving outcasts like jesus did is freedom a church for others i believe we are i believe we're becoming that but i also believe that it starts with me Say, you, Pastor Larry, no, I want you to take this finger. Take it up. Hold your, hold your finger up. It's not nice to point, so point at yourself and go, it starts with me. It starts with me. That's right. Point at yourself. We will not become this until this changes. Not this. Everybody likes to do this. Uh huh. Mm-hmm, he's talking to you. Boy, I'm glad you're here tonight. Boy, did you need this. <laughs> no, no, no. We all need this. May we become a church for others and may it start with me. It needs to start with me. How can we capture the community for Christ? By being a church for others and loving the outcast like Jesus did. Can we pray, Father, I just ask right now.